Cool, thanks. Uh, right, so you already know me, uh, and I'm presenting a paper that we wrote with Inesh, Safa, Jason, Gabriel, uh, Carl, and Maxwell. You probably know most of these names, but the, the few ones maybe you don't know, Ines Ippolito, Safa, Tremblay, Safi, and Jason Falk and Gabriel René. Um, so effectively, we're just going to um, cover the foundational concepts of explainable AI and active inference, such that it serves as a, um, as a, uh, yeah, as a foundation for us to move forward th towards explainability, because we've identified all together that it's one of the key aspects that potentially leads us to alignment. Uh, we're going to talk about the intersection of active inference with introspection, which again seems to us like the key way to, um, to get explainability. We're going to talk about practical aspects of designing AI systems, transparency, accountability, and then finally their ethical considerations. So we all know AI is everywhere, AI is very big and it's very scary. Uh, so things like deep learning, neural networks, uh, they're very efficient, but they're often black boxes. This is part of why they're very scary, is because we can't tell uh, whether we can trust them or not. They're difficult to interpret. It leads to skepticism, reluctance to adopt AI systems. Like We can see how even though we think they might be useful, we don't even trust the use they could have for us. Uh, and it's especially true in high stakes situation where we consider that the, the consequences of a wrong decision can be severe, but it's also true even in things like small potential outcomes, which we believe could have runaway effects, especially in a, in, in a group. So for instance, um, let's talk about the different kinds of places where these types of applications for explainability would have the most crucial impact. So for instance, let's think about um, healthcare where we have AI that helps in uh, complex diagnoses, personalized treatment plans, um, like hematology, for instance, it's being used to analyze various types of data, uh, radiographic, genomic, uh, there's quality of care where we could potentially help by discovering uh, non-obvious but clinically relevant relationships. So the, there's potential for extreme benefits for these, but there's a lot of challenges with the data itself. There's challenges with um, uh, information, consent, transparency, ownership, safety, and even costs. We see that LMs are not sustainably uh, cheap. An incorrect diagnosis uh, could, li could have life-altering uh, consequences, which means that even when we can show that the model is more reliable than the doctor's diagnosis, and we show this to the doctors, but they still have to be in the loop, the doctor will prefer reverting to their choice, which is shown to be wrong, even if the, the AI disagrees and the AI is at 98%, whereas the doctor could be even lower. Yeah. Can I ask a very stupid question? Is there any test on whether, you know, if you tell them, it's not an AI making this judgment, it's a colleague of yours? Oh, that, would be so, that would be so interesting. I don't know. I don't know, but I, I would love to see if, uh, if uh, the, there's a sort of Turing illusion, or <laughs> you could make them pass. But what is shown is that they don't trust the models, even when the models are demonstrably shown to, um, to make better decisions because of the black box nature of them, and they don't understand them as well. Um, <laughs> this can perpetuate bad practices and potentially cause severe harms. Um, it can also pose legal complications, and we'll go into the legal frameworks later. Uh, in finance, for instance, it's another really high-risk application. It's really funny that you're looking over there instead of over there. <laughs> um, for instance, uh, there's fraud detection, uh, assessments, predicting risks. This is extremely useful. This is one of the reasons that um, systems collapse. They're not very good at predicting risks. Their models always fail. Uh, and they know this, and they still use them because they're useless without them anyway. Um, and again, there's challenges such as uh, regulatory compliance, data privacy, uh, or, or the fact that um, they don't trust that an AI system would do better than them in a complex system. Uh, there's also transportation. So we could completely revolutionize the way that traffic is being handled, that we, we, that we uh, deal with motion of people. We could reduce most of the issues that we have and promote self-driving, right? We could have entirely self-driven cities that are flowing seamlessly, but 
We don't trust the models for navigation because we don't trust their ability to provide safety. Um, and we, we don't trust that uh, uh, they actually could not cause accidents at the level that, that humans do. And oftentimes, we don't know if they could or not. Uh, we've seen a lot of examples of the Tesla cars failing quite miserably uh, and having to be like taken back by the human. We, 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 we have a fear that if the human is removed from the AI system, there's going to be a lot of issues. And oftentimes, there's um, pointed examples where that's in fact the case. So the solution here would be enhancing transparency, because if you understand the system at hand, you're more likely to predict its behavior. Um, it would make them less potentially less harmful, but especially this would be key in minority outcomes. Uh, who often uh, lack the resources to combat misuse with AI alignment. We are very privileged. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people in this group are white men. Like there's like, what, four women and mostly non-minorities, which good for you guys, but it also means that we're the only ones driving uh, the, the discussion. Um, so there's a call for transparency that also extends to social organiza organizational context through the concept of social transparency to potentially improve decision making and cultivate a holistic explainability. Could you elaborate a little bit in relation to uh, minorities? Yeah. How is this explainability? Right. So, for instance, um, let's imagine that, well, there's been lots of examples of this, but some models are used, say, for policing, right? Um, and we look at the model and it's explainable to us and we don't see a problem, right? It's like, well, it's just applying the laws, okay, that's fine. But if we gave it to the minorities in question, they'd be like, hey, hey, those laws are known to be historically discriminating, like, you'd need a little more here. And so their access to the explainability of the system would allow them to push back on potentially biasing and harmful practices um, because it affects them most effectively. Generally, when there's a bias in a model, the people who tend to be affected are the most vulnerable ones already. Even if it can affect everybody, but it will tend to start with them. Just like global warming, whether you believe it or not, if it is a thing, the first people affected won't be us. We will eventually, but not first. So, um, we're talking about the fact that it must be explainable, but we're saying to who? We talked about minorities, true. Um, in general, we think experts, right? They're going to be the one digging into the system, but actually uh, it shouldn't just be domain experts. It should also be uh, lay people, people who are not, not versed in all of this should also have access to this explainability. So for instance, uh, citizens, because without citizen in involvement, uh, there won't be, um, there will be lack of citizen uh, involvement and education. There will be an alienation from them, even though the services are meant for them. Um, there'll be a limited understanding which will go, uh, lead to bias in training data sets. Um, there will be a lack of visibility in the method of data selection, which again leads us to potentially making minorities more vulnerable. And we get to the solution. Transparency, complementarity, privacy regulation will increase uh, consumer autonomy. It will allow them to promote sustainable AI for the end users, for the lay people. So we must make sure that explanations are not just for people who understand complex mathematics. Um, so there's a few approaches to this. The first approach is human centric. So you try to take AI models and you make them understandable to humans. That seems rather simple, right? Uh, you enhance trust, you facilitate decision making. Uh, basically, it focuses on navigating causality and force goodness to eliminate the false perception of inference. So you really want to make sure people understand there's a strong governance framework that enables their conception, at least, of goodness through uh, their capacity to ass assign causality to the decisions. Uh, there's the user-centric explanations. Oh, okay, sorry, M my slides have changed for no reason. Uh, there's the user-centric explanation, which focus on user needs, so it's um, application-specific. Uh, it makes the explanations more relevant to a given task, because you don't want to know everything necessarily, just what relates to what needed to happen. 
You have the stakeholder-centric approach, which uh, essentially tries to understand the different intents and requirements for explainability given some st stakeholders. Um, and so we, we push towards the customization of explainable AI. Uh, this could go through decision theory, which basically uses the principles and methods for making optimal choices under various conditions. So it's used to extend the notions of importance and utility in the AI systems. And essentially, we're trying to focus on nonlinear models uh, to integrate models that help evaluating the utility of different choices or decisions. Um, yeah. Um, you mentioned human user stakeholder centric. Uh, <laughs> help me, can you help me like, understand if I'm getting your message correctly? So, in this case, you are saying we would have a model that would stay the same, but that could be. <coughs> explained in different ways depending on who the target of the explanation is. So yes, and and but. Uh, we'll get to it in a second, but effectively you shouldn't think of explainability as an afterthought. So your model should be built at the okay. beginning, which means it's possible that the models would be slightly different from the get-go. And do you think that there would be um, inconsistencies or even say um, parts that actually, you know, would, you know, counteract each other, or contradict each other because of these different perspectives? I mean, I can't say that it's an impossibility, but given the aims, it's really just about making them interpretable and explainable. So I, I, I doubt it, but I can't prove that. Um, so there are several evaluation metrics that we think of, like fidelity metrics, comprehensibility metrics, consistency matrix, metrics, faithfulness metrics, and actionability metrics. So all of these are a little bit different and can allow you to put a human in the, in the system and be like, okay, how, um, how actionable do you think this explanation is? How does it help you? Or um, how consistent is it from the previous time? This is one of the reasons LLMs are rarely trusted because the consistency is really low. Like, I don't understand why it gave me this. I think my prompt was the same and it gave me two answers differently. So I don't understand what happened in the system and therefore I can't, I can't rate it better on the consistency. Um, and if we take a pragmatic turn, we effectively search for explainable models that are also interpretable in terms of decisions to offer a sort of pragmatic and naturalistic account of understanding AI. So we really want to focus on how it combines with psychology, right? We want to we wanna align this not just with it works, but it works because it's intuitive to someone like you and me. And potentially, the way to do this is to align the models closer to something that resembles a human mind. There's a, a lot of legal and ethical necessities. Uh, so for instance, regulatory bodies like the European Commission or the National Institute of Standards and Technology have tried comprehensive legal guidelines and more are coming online as well. Uh, they're outlining requirements uh, for AI systems, especially in high-risk areas like the ones we discussed, but this will soon extend much beyond these high-risk areas. It's basically a race to AI regulation. The, it, this is why this kind of work is extremely relevant now. Like We must do this explainability work now, otherwise it'll be done for us. And it'll be done for us by people who barely understand it. That's the whole problem. They don't have this explainability. Um, so they, they suggest that we must make sure that AI is efficient, ethical, accountable, auditable. Uh, so we must understand why they make decisions, not just because we think we have explainability, but actually because we can look into what happened. This would allow us to reduce distrust in AI systems, which is often due to the fact that there is no legal framework that's pushed by uh, governing bodies with a robust regulatory ecosystem. Not just some people saying, oh, you really should have done that. And then nothing. Sam Altman spoke to Congress. Great, that's cool. But nothing happened after that. Um, so we have to, again, this is where I got to, talk about transparency by design. So again, it must be before you build your system that it must be included into it, not afterwards. It's not an afterthought. This will push for a symbiotic relationship between machine intelligence and human understanding to align AI systems with human values, which ensures that they can be audited, held accountable, and trusted. So then we bridged a gap between computational prowess of AI with the human need for understanding these systems. We think active inference gives us this. 
for a variety of, re of reasons, including the fact that it is basically biomimetic. Um, we think it also performs efficiently and allows transparency and auditability. So, I'm not going to explain to you what active inference is. I don't think you need it. But I'm going to talk about some key elements that are relevant to this specific topic. So, we know that through active inference, um, organisms self-organize. We know that they're driven by the imperative to minimize surprise, which, you know, given a path or trajectory, uh, quantifies the degree to which you, you, you deviated from your inertial or characteristic path, which again, could be an interesting way to quantify potentially agency. Um, they learn models that are parsimonious, tailored to action, and this is pretty crucial, and they avoid by bad bootstraps and suboptimal convergence. Again, this is pretty crucial, especially for questions of alignment. I'm pretty sure if we were listening to Lars's talk right now, these two points would effectively converge. Um, it basically is the optimization of a world model with a causal structure. And the, the word causal here is pretty crucial. Um, it's the causal structure of the system generating outcomes for observations. So the models are interpretable, they're auditable, and in general, they're explicitly labeled. Now we're moving more and more towards models that self-build through uh, structure learning, but this is the time now to make sure that when we build these systems, we force them to be auditable. So for instance, one of the approaches to structure learning is through a curriculum. Depending on how you structure your curriculum, your model is explainable or not. So we could suggest that only curriculums that are properly organized be used. That's right, yeah. Um, effectively, one of the really interesting things we can do with active inference, this is something that sort of touched into what Scott was discussing yesterday, although we don't have to go as far as what Scott did, but they have the capacity for introspection and self-modeling. Again, this is um, mostly based on, on Lars's research, um, which is a critical component of human consciousness, right? We can do this. This is how we explain our actions most of the time. Uh, to do so, we have a hierarchically structured generative model, which facilitates introspection for self-evaluation. And in general, this isn't used for explainability. This is used for the model to modulate its precision. So it's, it's actually useful for the model to do this. Uh, they can modulate transparency and opacity at different levels. So no matter the complexity of your system, you could always derive some degree of opacity at the lower levels. And this is especially interesting for say, hybrid approaches. Um, it gives you cognitive control and focus. So, in another paper, we posited that, well, you don't have to agree with this, but this was a posit, uh, consciousness is an attribute of systems with an irreducible mark of blanket where active states exert a neuromodulatory influence over external dynamics, which suggests that consciousness is inherently agential. So this aligns with models of, I mean, Obviously, you were on the paper, but it also aligns with Anil Seth's model, any, any model that um, focuses on how the uh, inner demands modulate how you perceive the outer world and are capable of navigating through it, basically suggests that it's all geared towards the proper action. I mean, Donald Hoffman, Donald, not David, also kind of hints at this, right? He says, your model isn't a good, it's not a model of reality, it's a model of you in reality, of how it serves you. So we could see that introspective self-access can be modeled using active inference through hierarchically structured generative models, which explain how, access, uh, how we access and interpret our internal states and experiences. So we can see how, if we connect back to transparency by design, just from the fact that we are using hierarchical models that have the capacity to self-monitor, we're already um, gaining explainability from the get-go. We also make a critical distinction between overt and covert actions. So overt actions are observable behaviors. I really like my little emojis. I was like, how do you, how do you uh, show overt and covert actions? I was like, spy and ghost. Um, 
Overt actions thus are observable behaviors and covert actions are internal mental processes which are cru crucial for higher cognitive functions like introspection. And this is kind of important because the model will do things externally, right? It'll, it'll make a decision, it'll make a prediction, it'll tell you something. But it will also do things internally, which you don't necessarily have access to right away. Uh, it'll, it'll tweak its precision, it'll change its priors. So overt action can be like making a recommendation and covert actions uh, can be recorded or explained even though they're not directly observable. So through covert action, the system employs meta-inference based on the representations are of uncertainty or precision to infer its own states of mind. It understands what it's thinking roughly and based on what it's thinking where it wants to go, it, it pushes it a little bit because it has this access. So here the models operate on multiple levels of abstraction which allow uh, the, the system to make informed decisions based on both high-level abstract knowledge and low-level detailed information. This allows us to foster trust, fairness, potentially inclusivity, it mitigates bias. Um, they could be, for instance, used to report on their emotional states. If we say injected empathy into them through the, the model we discussed together like uh, for the past few days, uh, through these introspective processes and they would make the systems more understandable for, hues, for humans and stakeholders. Um, we know that this kind of architecture has already been deployed to, to mimic um, emotional inference. This is something our lab is also working on uh, and the, the system can both suggest emotion, suggest it understands the emotions of the users but we can also uh, give it emotions through work for instance that Casper has done. So we can see that uh, these systems are auditable, interpretable by anyone fluent in the operation of such models. Um, but to make it open to a wider audience, people who don't even understand active inference at all, we need to add an additional hierarchical um, element. So for instance, uh, the hierarchical self-access, the introspection uh, before, is a multi-tiered system which allows us to make inferences about emotional states, the rationale behind decisions, through this hierarchical generative model. Uh, it organizes information at multiple levels of abstraction through the interconnected layers, so it wouldn't just have to be, uh, you know, layers in the model. It could be any layer, any feature uh, at any given level of abstraction. We could use for this, you know, variational autoencoders, Boltzmann machine, Bayesian inference mark of decision processes, so long as it works as a hierarchical model. But then we need an explainability interface. So, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, we need to translate the AI's internal models and decision-making processes, potentially through the use of large language models for generating the explanations. Now, how do we make sure that these models don't hallucinate? The key question, the, the, there are several approaches to doing this. We can control hallucination, we can test for them. Effectively, you have a graph here. You have a labeled graph, so it's, it acts like a knowledge graph. Even better, it acts like a factor graph. So if you have the factor graph, you can generate an explanation with the LLM and then check whether it hallucinated if you embed the, um, the output and verified the embedded output through, say, um, a vector with the graph itself. And based on this, if it's too far from the graph, you just you, you do it again and you, you make sure that you can steer it. And this is the most basic approach. There's many, many approaches to verifying whether something um, has strayed too far from uh, the, the initial input. Um, we can also incorporate attention mechanisms. So the AI could focus on the most relevant parts of the data of the internal model, given its own introspective processes. So as you saw from Lars, uh, from Lars's papers on uh, in, um, introspection, you could see that the point of introspection was not just to see, it was to focus on what was relevant at a given moment. So through this architecture, you could give the possibility for the user to understand exactly what process was the most important for the decision made. Um, we also try to make sure that these, uh, the, the, the inputs to the system is multimodal. You don't just want a um, poor explanation, you want a very rich explanation. You want to know all the different factors that may have factored into uh, the exact output. It will give you more robust models and more robust decision making as well as more robust explanations. 
Um, we have started designing a component for handling different data modalities. I mean, there's lots of models out there. There are already multimodal. There's lots of approaches for it. We think that something like a universal embedding is the right approach because you can't train a model on every possible instance, but you can potentially connect them. Um, so of, of types of modalities you might want to check for. So the, the different senses you're thinking of, we have like five, so already you'd need five different senses to train on with the right labels and the right data. And then on top of that, there's every other kind of dimension you could add into a model. So that's, that's probably not the right approach to just training a huge model on all of the dimensions. You could just train one really well on one dimension and then connect the models through their, um, their, their connections. We have different approaches, uh, such as, for instance, um, uh, joint embeddings, for instance. Uh, you can have relative representations. There's lots of approaches out there, and we're trying to work towards developing an approach that generalizes much more than over two models, that can generalize over, over many, many models and connect them properly. To that effect, uh, one way to show the different kinds of data to a user, not just through text, is also through a potential digital twin. So you would show real-time updates and you would be able to label them properly, you would be able to explain them. So if I, effectively, let's imagine I'm um, driving a drone um, and I want to understand what my drone is doing and why it's doing it. So I could show you on the digital twin, well, your drone is looking for that object and it thinks it's here, here or here. So it's going to pick a path, and if it finds it, it'll disappear on your digital twin, it'll be here. But if it, if it, you know, if it uh, didn't find it, well, that option will just disappear from the digital twin. It'll be fully explainable because we have a graph. We can literally just plot this on a digital twin. So we basically have um, the suggestion to develop introspective AI systems to align with human values to ensure responsible development. We should emphasize the importance of transparency, accountability, and safety. Um, these are principles that we don't have to reinvent. AI for people has been long driving towards these. Uh, for instance, they're talking about pr principles of uh, beneficence to promote good, uh, non-malficence to prevent harm, which are not the same thing, um, autonomy, which is protecting human intervention, it's important, uh, justice to ensure fairness and explainability, transparency. It's one of the key pillars of alignment. Um, again, let's reiterate, it's especially important for low and middle income countries, uh, as well as public health, to ensure that the implementation is ethical for everyone and it represents everyone. If we talk about empathy, you can't just develop empathy by exposing yourself to only one type of person. Empathy is best understood when you have more models of people because you can modulate your model better. And there you go. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah? How do you... Um, how would you describe the main differences, say, with other approaches that people are having machine learning, reinforcement learning? How... What do you think are the strengths? In general, these approaches are not causal. Um, they tend to be um, recreative. Like one of the of the main approaches that I that I studied was, um, well, we can't really tell what the model really is doing. So what we're gonna do is model the model with the rules and try to see if the rules uh, do the same thing. And it's like, well, okay, that that's. Maybe, but like that's not really a, a guarantee, right? You don't actually see what the model's doing. What if I add causal to machine learning? I mean, it gets very close. If you add causality to the, to the system, it gets very, very close to what we're doing. I also think that um, causal inference is effectively uh, more frugal than general machine learning approaches, but this isn't to say you can't combine both. Effectively, if you wanted to put on top of your, that's why I mentioned the pre hybrid approaches, if you found a way to get your, your model to DCM over, say, a machine learning algorithm or turn your machine learning algorithm into a Bayesian algorithm, 
effectively all you're missing from these models is the appropriate labeling. In general, in a generative model, things are labeled. So you understand what they are and why they're doing what they're doing through a human interpretable way. Uh, that's why I said like the fear is that if we go closer to ML approaches from active inference, we may lose some of that explainability. And that's why I think that it's totally fine to go there, but we have to keep those approaches in mind and the curriculum approach has to be very well curated to understand. Yeah. Uh, so we know that uh, humans, uh, so the consciousness bottleneck is very, uh, is very tight. Like uh, humans can hold only a very, very small piece of uh, factor graph in, yeah. at one moment in time. And even some animals have larger uh, bottom line. Mm. And uh, my intuition is, maybe it's wrong, that uh, when the effective models are more complex than that, uh, like uh, in, when decisions require more than, let's say, five factors incoming, 20, let's say, then people perceive this as intuitive decisions. Like, for example, doctors often give prescriptions based on intuitions uh, and Presum presumably good doctors actually have good models, but they don't like, are not conscious of those models. And probably expert uh, drivers, maybe uh, uh, people who race in F1, you know, m maybe also the number of factors which goes into like m control of the car is higher than um, five at the moment. So this goes back to your slide about explainability to the people, what if the effective model is more complex than that and if you try to like reduce it down so that it's just a few like two, three, four factors, it becomes too inefficient. So I think that's a really interesting question. It's not something I've considered yet because I, I, um, I assume that in a causal model, especially a hierarchical one, you could always um, effectively um, go from a coarse graining to a fine graining. So effectively what you would get is a system that understands that if you go all the way to something tractable in the tree, you have two major factors and then you can go down. And I think this is something that might help, but I think it's an interesting question. Yeah, like how do we manage the different kinds of bottlenecks that would emerge?